Sam Shoemaker wrote a poem, I Stand by the Door. I liken this poem to being the church. I stand by the door. I neither go too far in nor stay too far out. The door is the most important door in the world. It is the door through which men walk when they find God. There's no use my going way inside and staying there when so many are still outside. And they, as much as I, crave to know where the door is. And all that so many ever find is only the wall where a door ought to be. They creep along the wall like blind men with outstretched groping hands, feeling for a door, knowing there must be a door. Yet they never find it. So I, I stand by the door. The most tremendous thing in the world is for men to find that door, the door that leads to God. The most important thing any man can do is to take hold of one of those blind groping hands and put it on the latch, the latch that only clicks and opens to the man's own hand. Men die outside that door as starving beggars die on cold nights in cruel cities in the dead of winter. They die for want of what is within their grasp. They live on the other side of that door. They live to find it. Nothing else matters compared to helping them find the door and open it and walk in it and find him. So I stand by the door. Go in, go in, great saints, go all the way in. Go way down into the cavernous cellars and way up into the spacious attics, into the vast roomy house, this house where God is. Go into the deepest of hidden casements of withdrawal, of silence, of sainthood. Some must inhabit those inner rooms and know the depths and the heights of God and then call outside to the rest of us how wonderful it is inside. Sometimes I take a deeper look in. Sometimes I venture a little farther in, but my place seems to be a little closer to the opening. So I stand by the door. The people too far in do not see how near some are to leaving. Those too far in seem preoccupied with the wonder of it all. Somebody must watch for those who have just entered the door but would like to run away. So for them too, I stand by the door. I admire the people who go way in, but I wish, I wish they would not forget how it was before they got in then they would be able to help the people who have not even found the door or the people who want to run away again from God. You can go too deeply in and you can stay too long and you can forget the people outside the door. As for me, I shall take my old accustomed place near enough to God to hear him and know he is there but not so far from men as not to hear them. And remember, they are there too. Where? Outside the door. Thousands of them, millions of them, billions of them. But more important for me, one of them, two of them, ten of them, whose hands I am intended to put on the latch. So, I shall stand by the door and wait for those who seek it. I had rather be a doorkeeper. So, I stand by the door.
Greetings and welcome to the Friday Morning Nameless. I'm Chad the Alcoholic, and do I have a show for you? Uh, this might just be the best show that ever happened of all time. Uh, so today I have uh, some some very special guests. Um, we have something uh, a new a new series that I'm starting right now, or that was started over here called the Friday Morning Frameless. I have no idea what that means, but it sounded like a cool thing to do. And so this is that episode. Today we have Lance. You all know Lance. Say hello, Lance. Hi, Lance. We have uh, the General Griswold Grimm down there. Say hi, Grizz. And we have uh, Clara. Clara. Hi, Clara. Say hi, Clara. Okay. Okay, guys. This is going to be very strange. I have no idea what is about to happen, but I would like you to to get to know Clara. Clara, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us all about what you what you why you are here? Well hi. Um why I'm here is kind of it's an existential question beyond me. But um I am really grateful for you having me here. I'm a sociologist. I study how people move into and out of their religious identities, other identities, and I'm really interested in kind of seeing what's happening in the corner how people got here, what they do, what they might do next. Um, yeah. Now, I, I how did you find PV, Clara, how did you find PVK? I uh, actually uh, started uh, this project a long time ago. I sit in a coffee shop and I do maybe what's, what's, what you might think of as Rando's conversations. I talk to people about these things. Um, and, and one of my friends there at the coffee shop uh, kind of uh, sort of drew the connection <clears throat> excuse me has been telling me about this community for a long time and then introduced me to, to, to this world yeah yeah so i ended up getting an email from from claire and she says uh yeah so my friend sourdough neil uh, uh sent yeah. me her way and uh and so i uh, and i'd like to talk to you i was like oh this is really interesting and so i I called Neil today to to ask him about you a little bit, and he's like, "Oh, that's so cool! She's gonna, you know, come on and stuff." And so, Sourdough Neil gets his name from from yours truly down here. And uh, amazing, I I eat his bread. So, is it good? See, now I, I met him over the weekend. I went to his church actually, which was really quite the uh, very cool. So, yeah, because my I have some in laws that live down about. 22 minutes from his church. So that yeah. was, yeah. You have a good time. How many times have you been to an Orthodox church? That that's the first time. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it was great. Other than the standing part, you know. <laughs> but man, I was like really impressed. I was. It was some of the most beautiful singing that I'd ever heard. There was uh, like the whole liturgy was about 95 percent singing, which was like. What? It was all in English, and uh, the smells and bells. It was just, it was, it was unlike anything I had ever experienced. I, the the part about the standing that I did like was like there was this bit of suffering that was happening. Like you can feel every part of your body that 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 aches that you don't normally feel aching. You feel it all ache, and I, I thought that that was uh, like an interesting embodied uh, experience as it relates to you know a, a worship uh setting so Grizz do you have anything that you'd like to do right off the bat here? or no oh, I'm shocked I, I no savings throws we're not gonna get any savings throws no. one time pass we're vulnerable to this Clara person we'll see what happens okay perfect perfect okay well any questions anybody no, but shoot, Clara, you can kick kick us off here. Tell us about your project. My project, um, I just I have the academic explanation in my head, but I feel like you don't you don't need that. Um, I see people, you know, like Neil does, sitting in the coffee shop and and going to churches and building this community, but then they're all connected to this space online. So my goal right now is to find out everything there is to find out about this um, space online. Um, like, I, I don't know. Can I, can I, can I ask Grim a question maybe? Yeah, sure. Grim, I, you're, 
I'm sorry, your channel's kind of impenetrable, but I love it, and I, that's that's a vibe I hear. Um, I'm I'm wondering why? How did this get started? What's what's going on there? Um, uh, well, some concepts started before YouTube and came to YouTube from a different streaming platform. There was a a, a man named Andrew who used Sigil Magic to get a conversation with Jordan Peterson and where he talked about how I struggle with pornography. And that was the launch of the Sorting Myself Out channel. Um, at one point, he had this weird guy on who said he was uh, managing, he had learned to manage his bipolar. And uh, long story short, bald guy with the porn thing leaves the show and gives it off to uh, the bipolar fella and another kid. And I was exiting the YouTube truther community at the time. Sure. But there I had learned that uh, people that watched channels together would get together on discords and organize and do group activities and stuff on there. And so I pitched the notion when the, the redhead kid and the weird guy inherited the channel. Right, which one had bipolar? The, the weird guy. Okay. <laughs> the redhead kid was pitching uh, himself as a therapist doing gestalt therapy. And, <clears throat> and anyway, so I pitched them the notion of having a discord and making the channel a community of us sorting ourselves, sorting ourselves out, which would have a better acronym of like T-S-O-O because that's fun to do. But they, they did take the Discord idea. Then the redhead kid left the channel. And then so it was me and the weird guy trying to keep the channel afloat. And then we had some disagreements and parted ways, at which time I leaned harder into my own channel. And But through that, that whole effort, since it was tied to Peterson, it let me do my initial connection with Pastor Paul Van de Clays and uh, what he had going with the Bridges of Meaning Discord community. Okay, so PBK, he's a pastor. Does that influence you and your religious um, stuff? Yeah, I really like to give him a hard time about how little he talks about Jesus okay. <laughs> and how much he talks about church. And um, so, like, him being so trollable really has influenced this whole project for me. How do you, how, if you had to describe your channel, to someone who knew nothing about it. Can I get like a 10 word, 10 word description? It's um, a live stream brought to you by the Virtually Not Alone Network, where the hive mind gathers. Okay. That 10 words. <laughs> what are you hoping to accomplish? Uh, that the people stuck on the, in their cells without human interaction get uh, parasocial human interaction with me and together in the chats of the shows we watch together. <coughs> yeah, man, thanks for indulging that. So what do you, so I'll ask you, uh, Claire. What what like what do you what do you find when you uh, when you're watching, let's say, Chris, Chris's show? Like, what's your initial takeaway? Impenetrable, Chad. She told us already. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not trying to hate. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to learn, but I I love that there's all sorts of different people here getting together, giving perspectives that I don't like. I sort of inhabit this tiny little corner of corner of the world you know this academic silo people talk about and i don't get to i don't get to hear and see um other ways of thinking about things well just so that you're in good company know that most people have the experience like when i first was watching grizz's show i was like what the what is happening like i don't i didn't understand the savings throws i didn't understand uh you know the the tech and you know re remember and body there is no agency. Like I didn't. It takes a while, and I, like actually, I have this clip that um that that I'd like to play. Uh, good. Maybe. I need coffee. Excellent timing. Yeah, I'm gonna play this clip now. This clip I think does a really good job of kind of 
laying out what I think the like the essence of Grizz's channel is. So this kind of has a nice explanation for some of the your sentiments. I don't know, just something about storytelling that that we 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 we've lost it with unmodern ways of telling. Yes. Do you know what we've we've retained? personal narrative so in every family there's somebody that's good at telling the stories of their family there's an mm. aunt or an uncle mm. you know so i was on tour in ireland and one of the things that you notice uh is that everybody uh, is a raconteur everybody uh, has the gift of making quite magical something that happened on the way to the bus that morning now in a in a mythically literate culture you would be able to take a personal anecdote, maybe something that's quite difficult, and you can see how the wingtip of that experience touches a myth or a fairy tale. Could be the story of David and Goliath. Mm. But in one way or another, stories help us reach out to the universe. They they orientate us and they settle us. But if all you've got is me, if the only temple you serve in is the one that you gaze in mm. all day long. Mm those stories are going to get awfully thinned out. So you end up with a sort of a, a facsimile or a photocopy of something. 200 years ago, a new story arriving was mm. an event yeah. in a village. Mm. And the storyteller would come and go, and then you, we'd all have to remember it. <laughs> yeah. And we'd all remember it slightly differently. Yeah. yeah. So the, the reason why, I, like what I see Grizz doing is very much like um, – like uh he's like a, a like a mythology storyteller in, in some sense like this is why you can't you know it's impenetrable because well some of it's a lot of this stuff is impenetrable you know a lot of the language is like uh, i remember i i sent my dad some of these videos from different channels and he's like i have no idea what the hell you guys are talking about you know and it's like yeah sometimes i don't either most of the time probably but <clears throat> Uh, so that's, I don't know. I don't know how else to describe that other than it's a kind of, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Lance, what do you think? Or do well, you for, No, I think, um, and so for me, and I, I'd say this, how I found my way into this little corner, I'm different than everyone else. I'd actually was searching for a sermon on a particular topic and I had Pastor Paul Vanderclays. A sermon came up and I watched it. And by the way, I loved it because it was low production value and everything. And I was a house church pastor. I love that aspect of it. It was really interesting. And he was talking about things that were like, wow, he's talking about that in church. So that was wild. And then the algorithm kicked up Grimm's first randos conversation with Paul Van and I was I was just mesmerized and uh, I hang out with a lot of guys who are kind of like Grimm in a certain way um, not really normies and so I was just first off I thought he was a just an interesting character I was very impressed that Paul Vanderclay a guy with status is talking to this random guy <laughs> you know I just thought that was like what is going on here and so <clears throat> I found my way in the bottom of the YouTube to this Bridges of Meaning Discord, and then I jump in, and there are all these amazing conversations going on with these with, with awesome people. It was it was wild, and it was something that wasn't existing, you know, out in the world. Um, what I what I really like about Grimm is Grimm sees things that, and I would just use the term normie, which I I fit into that realm to a certain extent although um, I might be called a conspiracy theorist by some. Um, but he points, he sees these threads, and he has this amazing ability to grab this little piece of this conversation and ties it into this movie. And he finds these threads and is just pointing them, kind of try, trying to bring these signals out so people can see, quite frankly, uh, the, how we're under so much control, right? And, and 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 plus he does it with a great sense of humor, which is just it's 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 hilarious to watch those things. I really like the community that came out around him. Like the, so, the people that come in and start chatting in his chats, it's funny. There's a language that comes up with those folks and those people. And so, for me, 
uh, he's the he's he behind all that he's pointing out these things for people to see them and hopefully they can see them but he doesn't hit you over the head with it like he likes there's he's he's he makes you work for it a little bit right and so you know he doesn't try and tell you exactly what he's trying to show you and that's i mean that's part of the thing he's trying to teach you how to figure some of this stuff out on your own right and there is this sense of that virtually not alone and so kind of the cast of characters that he brings together are people that may have been before this place had um you can't have the types of conversations or hang out with people or, or, or whatever and so that's why that's why i really like uh i like Grimm's channel and i made this one comment about Grimm, and i still think it's true I think Grimm is the sort of guy that was, if Jesus were to come come back or whatever in some sense, he would spot Jesus faster than most Christians on this earth. I think he'd get it. I think he'd see to it. He sees the thing behind the thing. So there's a there's a method to his madness. And so that that's what I like about what Grimm is doing. And I think he's, and that's why Paul, there's a reason why Paul highlights him so much. He's an extremely valuable person in his corner. Well, and, and the other part about the highlighting thing I think is interesting. Like he'll, Paul will do this thing where he kind of like, he doesn't necessarily reach up the hierarchy, he does more reaching down. Part of that is, I think, like it's, it's, it's a signal to anybody like, may, like maybe yourself who is interested in like uh, maybe intrigued by uh, participating or something or getting to know people more. It's like, these are the people you're going to be uh, running into, just so you know. Like they, you know, and and I would, I personally think that we're not all that weird, to be honest. I know this seems weird. I'm wearing a mask. I have my reason, you know. <laughs> and and like, and it, I guess it's weird, but I don't think it's that weird, to be honest. I, I think what's more weird is is um, how long most people have seemingly been asleep at the wheel that to me is is more weird <clears throat> and you know i've really been thinking a lot about this lately uh like well yesterday i kind of had like a just a shit show of a day and uh, in the morning and then as the day went on uh i got to listen to a couple different things and i was struck by a gratitude like like i couldn't really even believe like i'm thinking Maybe I'm just grandiose, but I really feel grateful that whatever is happening, I'm, I'm really grateful that I got to meet these people because I think that there's something greater than we can articulate and probably we shouldn't articulate it. And, <clears throat> but it's, uh, it, it's inspiring. It's fun. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 th I think it's uh, in, in, in invigorating, enriching, all that kinds of stuff. And annoying sometimes, you know. So. Wait, yeah. wait, wait. Why annoying? What, what, what's that? It's uh, invigorating and sometimes it's annoying. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's like characters can be annoying. <laughs> like they're, you know, not everybody gets along all the time. So like, that's the, that's the hard part because you know like, uh, for me personally, conflict isn't really a something that I that I'm good at or enjoy. So when they happen, I like I'm generally the kind of guy that wants to take my ball and go home. You know what I mean? I want and, and so that's where the annoyance happens. It's like it, it, and that doesn't happen as often. It doesn't happen that often, but when it does happen, it's it's a pain in the ass. I just I sense you're thinking of a particular example. Hmm. Well, I don't know if I would want to do that because yeah, that's fine. Because yeah, I don't I don't think kicking up ashes is a good thing necessarily um but it's just it's just when certain people say things that aren't uh 
seemingly kind or or um let's say um it just seems like well that was just a really stupid and brash thing to say you know and then and then it's just like a, a drama can begin there and that's just very uh annoying now generally we can see that at this point you can see see those things kind of coming from a mile away so i've learned to kind of just not converse with people you know or or watch certain content because <clears throat> it's just going to cause me a discomfort which is going to not make it's going to diminish my usefulness um so and it's all the things of like human annoyances right like uh, to, to some extent like i mean we all come here at least I, i'm of the if, if you were saying i'm of the pvk portion of the little corner you know you have pacho and you have verbaki and stuff like i'm a i'm a, i'm on the the, the the pv pvk group and so you know some of the annoyances would be i mean paul models very good faith dialogue right like you, we're gonna have good conversations um let people come in and so you know if some people want to come in and they want to be ideologues and kind of people that just want to come in and, and, and not participate in a way that kind of Paul call models. I think that can frustrate some of us. I think people are also are pretty vulnerable around here, particularly if they stick around here a little bit. Like again, a lot of this started uh, on Discord. Like most of the conversations aren't happening online. Like they're happening in Signal, they're happening in Discords, they're, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, <clears throat> but people start sharing some of their kind of some of their most sacred ideas or the things they really believe. And then if you have someone, even if it's good faith dialogos who starts challenging you about some of those core things, like that can, I mean, you start pulling the cards out of someone's house of cards, like, cause that becomes, it can be a hot button issue, you know, so on and so forth. So, you know, some of that can happen. And then it's just, you get a bunch of people who are sharing those sorts of stuff. I mean, we're, we're human beings. You know, and some people just are annoying. <laughs> they just are, right? And and there's like I probably have some people that probably like some of the things that I share or some of the positions I take. And then there are certain people that I probably annoy the hell out of because I am poking them right in certain propositions. Like I have a certain, you know, I'm coming within certain things. I'm I, I do have passion about certain things. So I'll start poking them right in something that's like at the core of like maybe even their religious belief. And you want to start, you want to piss somebody off when you, you do that. <laughs> do people get pissed off in the corner? Is that, is that something that happens? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's happening. Oh, yeah. I must have quit like twice already. <laughs> and I called Grim Grizz twice on his phone in both times. <laughs> like, that's my favorite part about, about this is being able to have connections with people. That like like Lance was saying, where it's like not online. I love, like I love um, doing these conversations. I love the like the creative process, the thing that goes into like the different, you know, um, for lack of a better word, the production, like or what like Grim Grizz's brandings, or if it's the the pulling clips off off of other channels and looming them together. All that stuff is really great, and and the conversations are. Like I said, they, uh, they're uh, maybe inspiring or whatever. They're fun. It's fun. It's a, it's a type of play. All of that's really good. But I really, like, there's a guy I, I talk with every morning that I met online here. Plus, I have at least a dozen phone numbers of people that I, like, I talk to on a regular basis. You know, and, and that's not just, and they're not the only people I'm talking to. So I also have, you know, my my community here in Wisconsin on the ground, those people I'm, I'm involved with as well. So there's, it doesn't pull me away. Uh, like I, yeah. So, yeah. When you talk about your community locally, I, I think I heard you say you, you go to a, a Lutheran church. Is that what you mean? I do. Yep. Yeah. I go to, uh, <clears throat> so yeah, well, I started out in a, a different church uh, some non-denominational church uh, a few years ago, like, and I got baptized there, and then I ended up um, just getting out of that church because it was a little, it was a little iffy. And um, after that, I asked my wife if she wanted to help find a church, 
um because like you know i thought it would be good to have her along for the ride if she would if she would do it with me and so um she did a lot of different research and we found a, uh, a church that we were at for a bit and then after we bought our house um we ended up going to this other church that's closer to home about i don't know eight minutes from the house here and yeah that's lutheran but am i a lutheran i don't think so i i, I don't i think i'm a lutheran as it relates to like my membership at the church but i wouldn't call myself a lutheran so brought what brought you in the corner chad to learn, to learn. what brought me into the corner <clears throat> well so i was uh on the job site uh listening to um uh i think it started out with audiobooks and then uh, uh my my, uh, my best friend was like listening to Joe Rogan one day and I'm, I was like, what are you listening to? He's like, I'm listening to Joe Rogan. And I'm like, oh, interesting. Well, and so then I went to listen to some Joe Rogan. The first, the first episode I was listening to was uh, uh, this dude, Nicholas Christakis. He wrote a book called Blueprint. I think it's something, The Blueprint. And it was really good. And I got that book and then I started listening to more stuff and then ended up tripping over uh, Jordan Peterson, which was intriguing to me because like, um, I think he had a, you know, he had, he had a charisma. There was a, um, yeah, he had, he, like he, he was able, he's a good storyteller. And so he can capture your attention really well. And then he starts saying things, uh, giving information about historical moments that I never like was taught about. And I was like, how the hell was I not taught this stuff, you know? And so that was like, I was like kind of hooked at that moment. And I started listening to the biblical lectures and I wasn't a Christian at the time. I think I was uh, about seven years sober in, in AA. And uh, so I wasn't a Christian, but I was already praying and, you know, uh, doing prayers and uh, helping others and stuff. So I had a spiritual life. Um, but I was, I was intrigued by, uh, his converse, his, uh, Peterson's biblical series on the Genesis lectures. And from there, I just started listening to all the classroom stuff, which the class, I think all, all the people who are around at that time would say the classroom, the classroom lectures, especially from like 2015, 2016, are the best, that's the best stuff that he has. Um, so I started listening to that stuff and, uh, I, I did trip over a Paul Vanderclay video early on. I didn't, I wasn't intrigued by him. I thought he was kind of annoying. He would, he would, uh, like, like lose his, tr lose track. And I thought he was like grifting off of Peterson or something. So I had this, this, uh, idea that I just, there's something about him I didn't like. So I stopped listening and then uh after like when 2019 2000 yeah 19 around there like we heard less and less peterson he was sick and uh i was just started listening to more and more audiobooks like a ton of them mm -hmm. and that whole time i was wondering uh, oh and then and then COVID, the covid thing happened and then throughout that whole thing i was thinking where the hell is peterson <laughs> like what like we like I wonder what he thinks about this stuff. I, I had also been thinking, like, I I wonder if he's going to, like, talk, ever go, how do I say this? I, I know I'm rambling, but. So I had I had some pretty hard, rigid spells in my recovery where I was like, you need to do things a certain way. They have, like, I was when I was trying to sponsor guys and help them, I was like, you need to read the book this way. And this is the only way yada yada so i had my own run-ins with with um uh like orderliness let's say and 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 i got sick in sobriety which means like i started disconnecting from people and my world got really small and um and i eventually uh it got so small that i it kind of crushed me and i and i came out of that and 
Um, and I started wondering if Peterson was ever going to run into some problems like that. Um, anyways, so during the, the COVID time, I was thinking, where is Peterson? And, uh, and then he came back. And he had this conversation with Jonathan Bajot, this this really, I think, uh, pivotal conversation in in both of Jonathan Bajot and Jordan Peterson's career, which was like, and I think it will probably go down as to be something um, very, very historic. And, and I only think that because of all the different people who have mentioned this conversation and the moment in that conversation where Peterson talks about, he has a sense that, the objective world and the narrative world touch, but he didn't know how that worked. And, and as he said that he was weeping, and, but I was right there too. Cause I, in my AA world, I was thinking like, like this God of my understanding bit, although it's working it's kind of running out of, like, I feel like I'm reaching the end of this God of my understanding bit. And, and I was wondering what, like, what, how do the Christians make sense of Christianity? Like I, like I had resentments against Christianity and I, I couldn't wrap my mind around Christ. The whole thing was kind of, every time I hear the word savior or Jesus Christ, I was just like snap shut. <clears throat> and so right around that same time, Peterson and, and Jonathan Bajot have this, this conversation where I'm reaching the end of my God and my understanding bit. Like, it's not like, I feel like I'm hitting the, the end of it. And, and something snapped to me and I, and I, I thought I need to reach out. Or I saw Van de Klee did a, a commentary on that video. And so I reached out to Paul and Paul sent me to the discord and that that's how I got here. Do we, do we have time for some clarification questions here? Well, yeah. Um, okay, I'm trying to get that. I mean, thank you for sharing. That's like, um, can I can I just ask, um, so you started out non-denom, but you weren't a Christian. You were praying and, and things. Um, and this was after your recovery? Yeah, during my recovery. I'm, um, I'm still in recovery. Yeah. During your recovery. Um, did you, um, before that, did you have... Um, any type of spiritual or religious practice that maybe you grew up with or? No, not really. Um, when I was about 12 years old, uh, I went to go live with my dad and he was in a, uh, like a mega church in San Jose. Mm -hmm. And I lived with him for about a year. And during that year, um, I ended up, uh, I did, I ended up playing the thief on the cross at the Easter play which is weird because like I'm this 12 year old kid and I'm in basically uh, like, you know, a sackcloth carrying a cross ac across the, the like these thousand people and getting it up the stage and then getting on the cross and asking Jesus if I could be in the kingdom. <laughs> it's so weird. But so I remember there was something about, about it that, that did speak to me, but when when we leave the parking lot, it, um, life didn't line up, right? So like my dad wasn't, I didn't think was acting very Christian. I'll just put it that way. <clears throat> so like, you know, I'm 12 years old, you know, so it's easy to, grip, to pick up a resentment there. Um, so yeah, I had that. And then I ended up moving back to live with my mom. And later when I was about 17, my mom lived in a, a, a parsonage uh, next to a church. And, but I was like, I was already fully in my alcoholism. I was way more interested in smoking cigarettes, drinking, um, and, and girls, right? So like, I didn't, it didn't speak to me. And I was a very troubled person. So <clears throat> yeah, yeah. But I would also say that my journey with alcohol itself was a spiritual experience, a spiritual journey. So, <clears throat> um, yeah. How, how was your journey with alcoholism a spiritual journey? Um, and, and does it, does it come up in the, like, I mean, I've heard you talk about it. 
Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a spiritual. I think alcohol or anything that let lights you up, like like alcohol lit me up. I mean, that's a that's a spiritual experience. I mean, there's a connection there that gets me connected. It helps it, it helps me feel like a person, you know. And so alcohol was always something that that would um, just make me feel like a person. And so when. You know, people have this, I mean, I know plenty of people who have not used any substances who have different things in their lives that, that, that there's that kind of power for them. And they're, I mean, what I come to find is it's an insufficient power, but it does work for a really long time. The problem is, is, you know, not being able to manage that power very well. I don't. I, I don't want to monopolize the conversation here. Um, but yeah, no. If you got questions, it's really good to ask I mean, anybody. If you want to ask anybody, that'd be great. I mean, is this? Are these relatable topics? Do y'all talk about? I mean, um, I, I'm. I'm really. I, I do a lot of work and have a lot of interest in how people sort of come into their um, sort of identities. And so it's really interesting to me, um, sort of how that's happening in the, in the corner, um, but also uh, how that's happening in, in people's kind of life trajectories. Um, so so it, it's very interesting to me. I, th I think I've heard each of you say that you identify as Christians. Is that right? I don't identify thusly. Oh, okay. Help me out. I mean, I'll, I'll say Christ is Lord, but uh, I don't like. Like, when part of the reason I trolled Vanderclay so hard in the beginning is because when you when I thought of Christian, I saw Ned Flanders, and then I also saw what was going on in the society around, like the way everybody just caved to lockdowns, how church was non-essential, and it wasn't God deciding who died; it was whether or not you wore a mask those levels of like what I thought would be faith like didn't pan out and uh, that the state had advanced to a war on human contact and everybody was being shoved in the internet which you know it's fine for a handful of people to sit in the basement and play video games and be stuck only interacting this way but for the majority of society to function that can't be the way it is and that's what was happening and but so uh there's no i personally i don't i don't wear the christian label sure. uh, for me the word means christ-like and he never went around saying i'm like me i'm christian so it to me is a pol political identity and not i don't know it's do you hold the flame is more a better question Okay, so can I ask? Can I ask, um, Graham? Did you grow up in a, in a home where, where you had where you had any kind of religious identities, or, or or when did you kind of? Sorry to ask two questions at once. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you came to kind of where you are now? I turned Pentecostal for a while, but then I saw Fight Club, and uh, <laughs> that reality was more reflective of the reality I saw. It was like a church was kind of like a time capsule of how things used to be. And uh, it wasn't matching the reality I was living in. So uh, the question I have around you, like, so when you're saying identity, what, I, I find that an interesting word. It's kind of a charged word right now. Um, yeah, it is. Okay, what, 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 yeah, no, no, no. So I would, I'm, I'm, so I'm curious. Why that? Why identity? Why identity? Um, I don't mean it to be a charge word. I, I mean it to be a descriptor of how I see myself in the world. Um, so that's kind of what I mean. I don't. I don't want to dig into identity politics. You know. Um, so people have many different types of identities. Um, 
Yeah. So I, I guess I, I kind of wonder why, why does it come off as, tra is it because of like sort of the sex gender identity kind of debate that's going on right now? Is it because of like, what makes identity charged? Can I, can I ask? Is that okay? Oh yeah. No, Anything you like. Yeah, no, I think so. So for me, which is, I think, so if you'd ask myself, it is, um, I think people are confused and I would say it's Christians too, right? So I think people are confused. In some ways, I think some of the awakening is, I think that people think they can self-determine that, like somehow you're self-determining that. Self-determine what? Identity or whatever, like it's given to you or whatever, versus something that is. Oh, okay. Okay. So if I use the word identity, that sounds like something that's determined by a person. Whereas if you use a different word, it's something that is. No, I, th I think I think I think it, I think that that's I think that's some of the stuff that's kind of going on here, kind of right yeah. now, right? Mm -hmm. Like so, <laughs> in recovery groups, there's this right before they get into their steps. There's this part where it talks about how it works, right? And it well, talks about things that you know, some things before they get into telling you what the steps are. Mm -hmm. And it talks about some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas and the result result was nil until we let go absolutely. And, and if you think about that, that's ideas about yourself, that's ideas about God. That's a, it's, it's like being willing to go on this spiritual path mm -hmm. and start doing these practices. That then when you do that, and there is this wonderful part in We Agnostics, uh, that, which is right before that gets into the step work in, in the books that the recovery groups use. It's kind of talking to them. But it, the very last sentence is, when we drew near to him, he disclosed himself to us. Right. Okay. And so I think in, in a lot of ways, I do think a lot of people think they self-identify. Um, I don't think they realize they aren't self-identifying. I think they're, being, they're giving identifications. By the way, that happens within Christianity, too. Mm -hmm. right? versus coming to an awakening and a realization of what is, right? And, you know, so you could go back to, you know, what I, I if you'd ask me what I identify as a Christian, I would say no. Okay. Although I went to seminary and it's the central part of what I am. I believe that I've become aware that I'm, I'm made in the image of God. I'm a child of God. And um, I try to very do it very poorly. Uh, I try to live that. And I'd rather not call myself a Christian. I'd rather be recognized as one, if that makes sense, by the way I live. And I think there's a, <clears throat> there's a famous speaker that talked around recovery circles. His name was Chuck C. Um, and pe people would ask him, you know, can you describe your religion? religion? He says, it's the way I live. Right. And so, um, and I think a lot of people, you know, so a lot of people come here because there are meaning crises and stuff, or there's lots of different things that bring people here. I didn't have a crisis of trying to find wisdom because I'm a part of recovery groups too and 12 step recovery. So I have a, this massive amount of wisdom and, and practice that I can participate in and community, like really good, honest community, like people who won't bullshit you because it's life and death. So it's really good, honest stuff. Um, and then also I've been very blessed to be, um, I believe in the person of Jesus Christ. And I had a very powerful experience in that. I've struggled to try and figure out how to live that out and where that would place me. I've been a seeker with respect to that. Um, and so, you know, that's not really a meaning crisis um, that I had. Uh, kind of coming in here. Um, but I think a lot of people come in here trying to figure out like the deepest questions, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and I also think identity is kind of what you think about yourself and some of these other things versus who you really are. Okay. You know what I mean? Like at a core, like at a core level and all this other stuff. So I just, I guess I just, I kick, I kick back at that a little bit. And again, so this, this is the perfect sort of conversation. You see what happens in the corner. Like, yeah. so yeah. I start hearing that and I start probing that. And that's why, and this, you know, that's what I, that's why I asked you kind of what, what that was, what kind of what that was all about. I'm curious. Um, 
So I'll, I'll give you a little, I'll give you a couple stories about identity. But I, I, first, I want to know what, what you think. Wh why do you think identity is important? Sure, I, I'm, I'm kind of blown away here by this um, dialogue. Um, because, you know, I sit in my little ivory tower and we use these words in a particular way. But um, so identity is important. There's a sort of a scholarly reason for including identity. Um, it's how we sort of measure. Um, you know, we ask people, check a box on a survey. Um, how do you identify? And I, I understand. I really um, I, I, I really like what you're saying there, Lance, about how, you know, identity is so much more complex. And that's kind of gets into the root of my question It's sort of I'm. I'm looking at these people and, you know, a lot of people have left, especially Protestant, uh, evangelical Protestant circles, um, but they've kind of kept that identity, but like church attendance, all those things, there's a lot of, there's a lot of moving pieces to identity. Um, so I didn't answer your question at all, Chad, I'm sorry. Um, identity is important because it's in the literature and I, I have to start somewhere and I start with the literature. But what you're doing is powerful and real. And that's, you know, that's why I'm, I'm doing this type of research to kind of uh, hopefully, you know, share and, and I don't want to say uncover because y'all have already found it. I'm like Christopher Columbus here, but like, um, <laughs> oh, we're, we're, we're just groping around in the dark around here. Just right. make sure. So, so you understand we have, we've been persuaded and we're trying to live our lives the best we can or whatever, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of groping around in the dark. At least I'll just speak for myself. I'm <laughs> sure Grim and Chad have it all figured out. But. Well, only on Thursdays so, <laughs> but so what but like okay Clara yeah can you, can you give me a personal answer <laughs> okay. not 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 the one that that you're afraid that not not the answer not the not the nice answer can you give me a personal answer why do you think identity is important for you why do I think identity as a concept is important for me? Yeah. Um, identity, I think, matters. It's just sort of, and I, I'm making an argument that's that's different than, it's hard for me to separate Clara the scholar from Clara the person, but I, I'm making an argument that says, um, you know, we have this way of looking at identity that's very static, stuck in one place, but actually, you know, people change over time and we can't really check that box on a survey. Um, so, so when we're talking about identity, I see I've, I've fallen into the, fallen into the trap here. Um, but, um, so identity is important to me because it's how people talk about themselves. Um, but not y'all. So there's more, there's, I need to learn how y'all talk about yourselves, you know? I like, I like that. Okay. I'm going to ask you a, a couple quick questions. Yeah. Uh, just a quick one. Uh, you don't have to answer at, at length, but um, can you can you tell me about the home you grew up in? You grew up in. Well, now you're interviewing me, Chad. Well, I just I just I want to try and demonstrate something. Okay. Um, it, like a ten an ten word answer. What? Just a ten word answer. Okay. Um, the home by home you mean the building? Sure. Okay. Um, the siding and a driveway. <laughs> um, kind of on a hill. I think that's ten. Can, can you tell me about your parents? Um, I have two parents. Okay. Um, now here, now here's where identity comes in. Okay. Can you describe to me the the way that your the potato salad tasted that your mother made you? My mom didn't make potato salad. Okay. Well, there goes all my questions. <laughs> it had onions in it if she made it, and I didn't care for those. Okay. So, like, the, the reason, like, yeah, Chad. like, what I'm trying to get at is there's, so I like potato salad, but I don't like all potato salad. In fact, I, li I dislike most of it. Um. But I can pick my mom's potato salad out of a lineup. Yeah, you can. And I really love it. And in fact, it's one of my favorite things to eat. I don't get to eat it often, but I really love it. And and I don't know why, I guess, that there's something in there that is a piece of my identity. Now, will I be able to articulate that? Or as you said, measure it? No, I won't be able to. Okay, okay. Uh, 
but that's a piece of my identity, a piece that I don't really think about often. Probably never unless I'm doing something like this. But I know that it has shaped my identity and my identity in some way through the relationship that I have with my mother. You know, and here's another thing about identity. So I, I was born with a cleft lip and cleft palate, and for I don't know, 32 years of my life, I, I there wasn't a day that would go by that I wouldn't recognize or think about the fact that I had a cleft lip and cleft palate. So I, I I knew I had this thing. I was very aware of it. I like it was always it was always somewhere back here in the back of my mind as a piece of who I am. This was a very big piece of identity for me. I don't know what that meant exactly. Maybe something to do with um, uh, maybe how God wronged me, or you know, like uh, it, it had something to do with how I viewed the world and how they picked on me. All these different things. Like and, and I, I and they they came out sideways often, <clears throat> and then I ended up like going going through and like having a a series of transformations through the work that I did um, outside of the corner in my twelve step groups and um in the step work and things like that, and then I had like this conversion experience and all this different stuff. Like I don't I don't ever think about. That, that whole thing about this cleft lip, it, this only ever comes up if I'm talking with, like, s telling somebody the story about talking about identity so, or transformation. Like, that was a huge piece of business. Now, that wasn't something I, like, actively tried to get rid of. It wasn't something that I, like, drilled down in to, like, really hone in on and, and, and will my way out of. It's just something that evaporated, like many of the things evaporated um so yeah and then yeah the, the identity thing is is kind of weird um because i i don't think I, I don't think much about identity actually um i used to identify i used to identify as a guitar player a musician i wanted to do that my whole life so i had all these i i used to very much um be uh like kind of um what's the word uh, like Im Im implicitly engaged in an identity game for most of my life and now i would say that um yeah for the most part now it doesn't really show up um other than the fact that i'm a husband i guess i, I could identify as that i, I do identify as a, as a husband i guess um, yeah, that was just a strange ramble. Do you identify as that, or are you that? Oh, I'm definitely that. Um, but hmm. if I may, please save this, please. Uh, your light. And if you know a lantern, like you can adjust like how the light goes in and out of it. And identity is a constellation of axiomatic shadow lanterns through which you project your light of selfhood. Uh, much like Indra's web, you can't see yourself other than reflection and the way you project your light reflects off the personality constellations of the people around you, and that's how you get your sense of self. Um, the lanterns are axiomatic presuppositions, the lenses, the frames with which you view the world. Some of them you're aware of, a lot of them you're not. Those are like shadow things you think about yourself, like uh, you're stupid, ugly, and not good enough. Like you might not know you think that about yourself, but there might be filtering some of the light that you are in one of your shadow lanterns. Um, and I guess what you identify as are, are the ones you at least think you are or think you want to be. So there, that's what I think about that. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice.
Hmm. Well, do you have any other good questions for us? It's not directed at me. I don't. I don't think I had any good questions yet. Um. But sorry, my partner came in asking if I wanted pizza. No, I'm busy. Um. <laughs> but okay, so you there's implicitly engaged in an identity game. It's Chad's thinking. Versus versus uh, Grizz's kind of conception of identity and the self kind of as something that's playing out over time versus Lance's idea that identity isn't a real thing. We should really be thinking about what's essentially there. Is that right? Have I got everybody right? No, I, I, no, I, was, I was just asking the question. That's what we do. We start kind of probing around a little bit. But yeah, no, I do think, I, do I think that we... Do, do I understand that that's absolutely a thing, right? Um, I don't know if I would use the word identity. I certainly, you know, one of the people that I can lie, well, I lie to myself more than I probably lie to anybody else, if I'm really honest about it, right? I think that um, that that's kind of, uh, you really have to watch that self-deception. You know, and then also most people put on a mask and they go out and they, you know, try and project, you know, certain things or whatever. And sometimes you even believe that lie, you know, or whatever. Usually when you're around those people, it comes off pretty, you can, you can see through a lot of that. And you can tell when someone's genuine or when they aren't, you know what I mean? Um, but I, but I would say, you know, one of the things that, um, I guess through all the things that I've been through. So for example, I've been through career, uh, recovery, I've been in a rehab. That's an intense experience over a 30 day period. <laughs> One of the things they'll do in that is they'll put you on a hot seat about 25 days in and every person who goes around is there, tells you something that you, they think, you know, basically points out something in you um, that um, maybe somewhere, something where you're trying to bullshit people on something or some aspect of, of you that they see, whatever. And it, it's a pretty, it can be a pretty brutal thing to go through. But the interesting thing, so, so why would they do that? Because at the end of the day, it's like, you know, those are the sorts of things they're gonna take you back out the drinking truck, right? Because if people care about you, right? Everyone's in there trying to fight to stay sober and everything else. Um, and so you need to you need to hear some of those hard truths about yourself because you don't start getting honest you're not gonna you're not gonna recover right and so um uh, you know i think i think ultimately where i would say where i've where i've tried to get to um and by the way this little corner is is has been it's it's helped my spirituality in a really big way um, because they held some mirrors up to me of some things that I even that it, I didn't even know was bullshit, but it was bullshit. And I, part of it is trying to figure out really what is like who who are you really? Like who are you really? Not I wanted to be this or I wanted to that. No, who who are you really? At the end of the day. Um, not this program stuff that's come down. This is set, like uh, Grim talks about set and all these other things and so on and so forth. But you know, kind of, you know, who, who are you? And this is, a, and these are, these are deep, 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 deep questions, right? Way beyond sexuality or any of these other sorts of things. Right? Um, so I know that people put on a lot of masks and play a lot of identities and so on and so forth. But I think the journey, I think the, the journey is is deeper. That's, that's what I would say. Do I understand that people, have I played the identity game or whatever or so on and so forth? I'd probably just use different terminology, but, but yes, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not pushing back to say that, you know, the people don't identify and try and live out this identity or so on and so forth. I, 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 I feel like you're also saying there's a layer of bullshit to any identity because it is, it's a performance. For sure. And, yeah. You can't fit all that you are into a single moment or context. So something like that has to arise. 
and and the ones that arise often and you use often and you get familiar with become what you think of yourself. Yeah. So and I think and I think one of the one of the deepest things that you can think about. I think this this little corner really helped me to see this and then also some of the transformations I went to. Because there's this concept of the unity and the multiplicity, right? One of the one of the biggest things that can truly happen to you is when you realize your connectedness with every other living human being, right? Sure. It, it has nothing to do like with the politics and the hatred and the culture, all this stuff, is, and it's not good. It's, and it's even your enemy, a person you hate more than anything that you are connected to at a deep level. There is this, you know, I, I see everyone as being made in the image of God. There's this connectedness. And for me, through Christ, is he's the unifying point and, you know, so on and so forth. So, so there's this unity, but they're all, but we're all, there's, there's only going to be one grim in eternity which is wild. Like you start thinking about that stuff, which, which is crazy. So there is this, you know, ultimately what happens is, is when you get into that unity and the multiplicity is a lot of this identity stuff falls away. And then when, so when I say we're all children of God, like at the end of the day, like with that, so that that's when so when Christ comes out and says that you love your enemy, right? Mm -hmm. What he's meaning by that is that you don't have enemies. <laughs> in many ways, right? Like that that's your brother, that's your sister, that is who you are connected to, right? And so that's the that's the thing that breaks down all that stuff. And so um you know I, I think a lot of that stuff that we that we can see and of course we have you know you know I have lots of things about me that you know say who I am, you know. I was uh I'm all a, a white guy who was born in Nebraska, who, you know, has this sorts of thing. You know, I, I have certain things that are the milieu that I went into. Um, but, uh, um, and, and I think more than what I think about myself, that's why I pointed to the, how do I live, right? Like it's that, that speaks so much more than anything I think about myself. It's like, what, what, am, what am I actually doing? You know, there's this, you hear this thing, you try to get to your, when your insides can match your outsides, you try and get how you act in the world to match truly who you want to be. You know, that's when thing. that's when you really start um, living a life of freedom, you know, and, you know, those are, those are hard things to, um, those are hard things to kind of come together in. And that's, and that's, and by the way, that's a daily struggle, at least for someone like me. Um, I'm wondering if I can ask, like, how do people in the corner and, and, and around, how, how do folks come to see this unity and multiplicity? How do they come to kind of achieve, I mean, I don't know if you all share in this sort of connectedness that, that Lance described, but like, how do folks come to that? Do they come to it? Or is there a particular point? That's like, so that's me. So here's the deal. I'm just sharing my experience, my story, right? Or how I would see things, you know, because you're when you're trying to interest in how do these different people come together, and here you got this Lance guy, and you got this Grim guy, and you got this Jag guy. You're going to talk to other people, like how do they see see things? There's a wide spectrum of people in the corner because there would be some people that would hear me. There are some people who hear me talk that way, and they will they will say that's a crock of shit, you know, and we'll argue about it or have a dialogos about it, right? Hopefully, a good faith conversation. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't think we could personal we we could actually speak for any anybody. Yeah, I can't speak for. I, that's not a. There are a lot of people that talk about those concepts. So like, if you would go to Grail Country, like the people that are on Grail Country, that would be something that would really resonate and connect with a lot of the folks who are on there a lot. You know, sure. those sorts of things. I think there there are a decent amount of us that could see those sorts of things, but there are. Um, you'll you'll get in. You'll get. I'm sure you'll get an answer for some people. Say, what do I identify as? No. They'll list. They'll list it off. So we're we're a we're a we're a wide mix of people. But hopefully we come together and we can talk about these things. Like you know, ask some questions or whatever. We just talk about it in good faith. Have a conversation. Try to understand the person a little bit better. If you're really doing it well, doesn't mean you always agree with everyone. Because I don't agree with everyone in this little corner of the internet. But what I do agree with is this. Like Paul keeps talking about, like 
I think the thing that binds us together is love. I think it's people who, for the most part, people are seekers. They're seeking, you know, I think we're all seeking God deep down, but seeking whatever they're seeking here. And hopefully you can come together with the great example he gives and he models good faith conversations. Well, there's and all lets people tell their stories. And if you watch the randos, like they're, they're all over the place. You know, there's some threads, but. I think there's a, there's a, a deep connection that happens. That's hard to art articulate. I think for, for me, connection, the idea of connect, connecting with others is the, is the most recurring thing. Um, like both of these two guys, have stayed in my house before and you know and uh, i spent uh a few days hanging out with grizz i spent a few days hanging out with with uh with lance and those are all on different occasions completely different occasions and i have a connection with those guys and there's a connection and that happens in the conversations too you know like that's um um Something that people would often, I would hear people often say, uh, there's a couple things I would often hear people often say. They would say things like when, when, when we would first, when we first started talking about Jordan Peterson, they would say something like, um, man, he said something that I felt like I knew my whole life that I couldn't articulate. But when he said it, like, it's like, yes. Oh, so it's like, it's giving a name to something that's, very difficult to articulate especially if you're not you know if you're not um educated uh, with certain certain things but it's beyond uh education and intellect is that's a connection point it's connection there um and the other thing that i hear a lot of folks say probably 90 percent something like that of people was they they said um you know for years, I was listening to this stuff and I had nobody to talk with about it. And so I think that's a common thing. That not everybody has that, but a lot of us do. And so there's a, a, an excitement and connection with uh, with conversation. I think that's what they mean by dialogos. You know, it's like, it's like uh, I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with somebody where it's just like, 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 conversation it felt like it was like 10 minutes long and you just had two hour conversation it was like really really powerful like that's i think a good definition of dia logo something that hits uh now that's not a word i really like to use a lot because i really don't know exactly what the hell it means <clears throat> but it doesn't seem to matter because i still have the, the thing that you know that 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 i still experience it um uh so yeah, connection is in a, uh, connection in the positive sense. So, and I think that I think yeah, I think I think that's absolutely it. And so, like the conversations I have with people here, I don't have a lot of people in my real life that want to have these types of conversations. You know, but one thing I would say is I didn't have like uh, I realized I just realized this a couple months ago. My meaning crisis was. When I was watching, it really hit, started happening with all this cultural war stuff. I was just seeing that this political like stuff was not getting fixed. Like I just something was broken, you know. And I just could tell that something was was wrong. I I, I had enough. I had faith. I have faith in everyday Americans that. If given a chance to vote, they'll try and keep some. They'll, if you give normal people the opportunity, that they'll be able to keep it somewhere in the center, you know. And then I was kind of a political wonk, so I knew certain counties, so I could track certain counties, and when there were certain trends or whatever. And on that election night in 2020, when I went to bed, and then I woke up at six in the morning, and I saw all these weird anomalies, like the one that happened was in your state, Wisconsin, Chad, where they dropped 100 percent of all these votes. And the vote went like this and it went to 300,000 overnight. And I realized they stopped all the voting. And when I woke up that morning, I knew immediately, oh my God, our vote, our votes don't matter anymore. And I knew, only knew that because for 20 years I had tracked at this real detail level and I saw these anomalies and I saw them forcibly kicking people out of polling stations in Philadelphia. 
And I'm like, oh my gosh, wait a minute. This thing, I had this faith in the United States. I, I had this, I literally, I had this faith that this thing wasn't so corrupt that they literally would not give the regular people their opportunity to speak. And it became so obvious to me. So my meeting crisis was, and this was right before I hit the bridges of meeting, is, you know, I had to try and figure out to like, oh, this, this, this thing is much more corrupt than I ever thought that it was. And this wasn't just one political party. I mean, this is just the whole thing was so far corrupt that the, the, that the people um, weren't going to be able to have their say. And that, I had to grieve that. Like I, cause I, I just had this faith. And so, you know, one of the things that really happened to me is that I needed to have that political thing totally smashed in. And that was a good thing. Like that was in some ways, it, like almost the USA was an idol, like this belief in, of course we weren't as good as we needed to be, but there was this ideal that was out there that I, I, I believed my whole life. And so that, that, uh, that was my meaning crisis. And what I realized was I didn't want to keep, I didn't want to keep having the same conversations where people are just doing this because that's not going to work. And that wasn't the solution. And so what I really liked about coming in here, the first thing that I was drawn to is people were having conversations about tough things and they weren't stuck in the political, like they weren't arguing about red, blue stuff. Like they were talking about really interesting things and going back and forth. And so there was, so there was good faith dialogue going on. I found that first that, that, that fascinated me. But then the deeper I got to know when I got to meet these people, these are amazing, like there is amazingly smart people. Um, some educated, some not. There was all this wisdom and there was all this stuff. It was this, this it, was, it was quite fascinating to me really what was going on. And then the other thing that I didn't realize, but I came to realize is I struggled with, a, we call them Sunday school answers. So the really tough questions of life, like why is there human suffering? Like all, like the, the, the questions you should ask, right? Like if there is a God, then why is there so much suffering in this world? Like if you just get some Sunday school answer, that doesn't do the trick for you. And even though I knew I had this faith, I, some of these, I just felt like I didn't realize how many of the answers that I, you know, weren't, weren't good enough yet. Um, and then I was, people were having these depth conversations where, I was able to take what was um, a lot of wisdom and a lot of things that I had, and I was able, it, it took it to, to the next level. And, and so the, the depth of what you can contemplate here is something that I've never experienced in any other group or community that I have. And so when, when you can do that, it's amazing. And I'll, the one thing I have a, a good friend, Jess P, who's a part of this community, started talking about where if you have these big, hairy questions and they're not getting an answered in your life, and it's lots of different types of big, hairy questions you have, like the hard ones, when you can come together, when all of a sudden something clicks, like you, you understand it, like something makes sense. When that comes together and you just said, that's healing. Like when you can integrate something, you know, where you had this disconnect or maybe you didn't know it exists, but when all of a sudden you can integrate something and you have that aha moment. And what that is, is like, once you've learned something, you'll never, you'll never be the same again. Like once you know something and understand something at some level and those tumblers work together, we, every now and again, we have some of those moments and those are those moments to where like, so that'd be like that spark, that moment that Jess would call that's healing, you know? And I think, I think a lot of what I've seen happen with people too, and I've seen transformation and I've seen people move from, they were once way, one way and now they're this way, or they talk about the struggle they had and now they're this, 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 this different way. I think that what happens in this little corner is people engage in these conversations and those things happen. I think what you see is a lot of healing. And so we talk about big, weighty, heavy things sometimes. And then the other times it's happened is I've also, I've met Chad in real life. I haven't met Grim yet. I got to get that taken care of. Um, but I've had conversations with people offline where we've reached out and they you know, seek me. I've sought other people out where you start developing, you know, you know, um, 
relationship and you can get, you know, a real private conversation and you can get really vulnerable with one another, you know, about struggles you're having and those sorts of things. So I, I think that sort of thing that happens is for me, what I think a lot, it's a part of the magic about what this little corner does. I, I'd like to ramble for a couple. <laughs> Please do. You say what what the what are the things that brings the people here? I think are our commonalities, and a lot of those commonalities are. Uh, I think it's people who have been wrong for extended periods of their lives before, like for a matter of years, and come to the realization that they have been wrong. And I think that it's people who have noticed the polarization and corruption of their information sources, and have come so they they come with this package of what they believe and what they've thought but they they're open to the notion that they've been deceived and uh, basically we all start wandering around together um, looking for what's not deception because we're in the new this is an unprecedented time for humanity when all of information is at our fingertips and we can compare and contrast the different beliefs to systems and see things why they are the way they are we can follow the the purchases of stock companies and find out that blackrock and yada yada just own each other and together they own everything and and all of this we're all coming into this information and it's way too much information for any of us so the, we've we come together and we're trying to figure what's going on out together and I see it as a sea of information and and I call it the fire ant flotilla because like fire ants cling to each other in a flood to make a raft. And that's seemingly what we're doing with these channels and being together in the comments and such. So I think that we're all in that context, the modern human context together and our trusted sources of information have become less trustworthy that we're now trying to find again the human connection particularly when we notice that when they clamp down on us the human connection is what they're trying to sever so that makes us cling to it and each other tighter uh, if we come to see that at least and who knows how much of of what is coming together has been directed together by the algorithm simply because we managed to have three hour videos that keep people watching for three hours and that's what the algorithm likes but all of this stuff we're trying to figure it out together and that's what brings us here i think mm -hmm. <coughs> i think that's a good point Graham. i would think that i think a decent chunk of people that have come here have had something something they th thought held maybe a position they held deeply that they've come to change that, that they've come to learn something new and have had had some some new revelation no new revelation and, and that takes a that takes a bit of open-mindedness to do that um i also think that what helps you do that is uh if you've experienced some sort of crisis <laughs> of self and you know you in the, you're, you're asked like i said you're asking the big hairy questions and some of those other things i think and not everyone who comes in our little corner is open-minded and there are certainly some people that probably haven't changed a whole heck of a lot and then there are others that had massive transformations so uh, you know so one thing that happened to me talk about calling out bs that so here's the trans there's a few transformations but here's the transformation that happened to me i was a uh charismatic uh evangelical house church pastor right and i come in and somebody asked me a hard question and this is a theological question but i don't think that matters to you but they're basically it's around this concept of the penal substitutionary atonement theory of, of christ's crucifixion it's basically god was pouring his wrath down on you know whatever and and so he had to pay the price for our, our dirty dirtiness and everything else and i i kind of I had some milieu in that. I was Methodist or whatever. But anyway, any rate, there was this conversation and a good friend of mine who's a really good friend now, Luke, says, what are, what are you? Like, are you a pastor or something? He Because I was annoying him the way I was preaching, kind of being preachy on this. 
And then there was a, a woman named Sherry Studer who asked me, he's like, why are you so sure of that? And I listened to that. And then one of the things that connected with me is like, I realized I needed to listen to that thing. And she didn't say it. She didn't say it in a mean way, but she also said it in a stern and honest way, right? And I immediately sensed that. So what do I do? I ended up starting to think about that. And then I, all of a sudden I find myself reading like early patristics, like or the ancient earliest Christian writings and stuff and all this stuff. And I find myself being opened up to this whole world of this Orthodox Christianity. I'm like, what's this? I've been on this journey. I've been seeking everything else. Like I knew mega church was failing and I, that's why I did house churches. We could see the church collapsing in the United States. So people are moving to calling themselves nuns, which is a identity marker or whatever. You start to see that. But anyway, I saw that these, all these, all these models weren't working, but a new Christ was true. And I'm trying to figure out, I'll, I, I, I will leave my job. I left a legal career to go to seminary. Like I will do radical things to do this. So I, so after 30 days, instead of reading about it, I wanted to see, and this is exactly what I said, is I want to see if this works. So I went down to my closest Orthodox church, five minutes away, because I wanted to start practicing. Like, is this stuff? And then I, I immediately saw this thing that was just so opposite of anything I'd ever been brought up in. And I immediately um, realized I was home. And there was lots of stuff that happened in that. And so I find myself, coming here trying to find a good faith place to talk about things as my political world collapsed or whatever or whatever this idea was i i come in here and i end up finding my way into now moving into becoming an orthodox christian that's a radical change for charismatic house church pastor um, but and so but for me one of the things i'm blessed with is like but I've had to learn this, like I am willing to change based on new information, new understanding. This is something I'm, I'm passionate, I will say about those things. And so, you know, um, that happened because someone was honest with me about something and I was willing to kind of hear that. Um, but that also goes back to, I had to learn some of those lessons the hard way. I mean, I'm in recovery. So um i needed to get hit by an upside my head with some of these two by fours and i've had a lot of success in my life but i also had this other thing which just you know almost utterly destroyed me too and so um i do think that one of the things i respect most are or what i really love about this little corner as i can see it is like he talked about is when somebody has is open to really having a potential fundamental change. If, if, if and so you know, I think that, that anyway. So that just was a little bit of talk. We, we tell our stories or whatever, and you kind of highlight some of those things. So if you would ask how the little corner has transformed me, that that one voice chat on a BOM Discord server answered a lot of questions. Some of which I didn't even know I had, and sent me on this entirely different path my spiritual path that will continue till well continue forever <laughs> yeah and I, I relate to that um the, both of what grizz and and lance was saying about the um <clears throat> uh, uh, so so to the biggest pivotal moments uh for me in in life revolved around the question of uh uh, what? Why am I saying that? Like, like I, it's, let me see, let me tell tell a quick story. So, so there was this there's this book in recovery. It's called Living Sober, and um, a lot of my 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 recovery heroes would go around and talk shit about that book. They said that book is stupid. It's not real recovery, and and I really looked up to these guys, <clears throat> and so I never read the book. And when I heard other people saying that that book is great, I would say, or they would talk about that book, I would say, oh, that's, that book's bullshit. It's not real recovery. And this is around my, my rigid period, right? And then one day I, was, I said that, I said, that stupid book, it's not real recovery. And then I, I caught myself saying it and I was like, 
why am I saying that? And, um, and, and so I, I ended up having to read, uh, like I, I took the initiative and read the book because like, I'm like, this is weird. Like, why am I just going around and telling people that, uh, you know, something is bad if I've never read it, you know? And so I read the book and then the first line of the book says that this, the, they're the, okay. The complaint that these guys had was they would say, it's not a book of, it's not a real book of, it's not a program of action, right? Or for recovery. And so um, the, when, I, when I read the book, the first line in the book says, this book is not a program of recovery. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, so anyways, what I learned there is I, I had my own experience with something. And it, and it was a good experience, you know. And so from there, I started to question myself in a lot of different areas. If anything would... Uh, if I would notice that I'm saying something that I don't have experience with, um, that would, a lot of the pivotal moments for me happened around that, that attitude change. And so I, I think that that's, and I only got there because of through, through, you know, painfully hitting the wall time and time again, you know, it's like, I wasn't like, I didn't wake up one day and think, well, where the hell am I going wrong? Or, you know, like it's, I'm just too kind of dense for that sort of thing. Uh, so like, so I think that, um, yeah, I think that, I don't know. Uh, I, and so when I heard Peterson talking about that kind of stuff, I, I really identified with that too, because he would talk about when he was younger, he, you know, had this, this realization that he was saying all sorts of stuff that he didn't actually believe. And so like, I really, I, I connected with him on that <clears throat> and, uh, yeah. Speaking of saying things you don't really believe, uh, I'm about out of time. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to hear from me before I go? Can I just say I, I um, I'm I'm really sorry. I called your your channel impenetrable. He loves that. He that'll probably be the theme. That'll probably be the theme of his next live stream. He loves that. When you figure it out for yourself, it's yours. If I tell you, it's mine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Chris. Um. So, th it is. This is kind of strange because, um, like, I sense that. So you you are wanting to ask questions, and you kind of have like an, an incredible, uh armor up against being interviewed it's i get that sense of that you spend too much time talking to sourdough now no no I think it's when i ask you because i asked you about what identif identity means to you and it was just like no i'm gonna skate around that can i skate around that yeah oh yeah totally <laughs> um, um so in in like is that is that just a professional armor that you have on or what is that um so i think there's two things going on um i think you know i put on a sociologist hat right and we have this kind of professional vibe that we're supposed to have whatever um and then there's you know claire the person who's just really not good at this kind of um you know what i mean i feel like that maybe sort of is what you're picking up on okay okay so yeah you you're having to be fair, I would say this, like Chad and I, because we're trained in this a little way, like we get real, real quick and stuff. So that can be a little off-putting too. You're like, wow, you know, I get it. Cause not everyone, yeah. I dig deep, but I'm usually, you know, kind of in the interviewer seat. I think that's kind of, um, I'm usually asking the question. I don't know. So, no, no. So what I see happening here is this is where I see a lot of um, people that end up staying in the lurk because they, ha they have the kind of, the intuition that you have about about um, your own situation maybe you're not comfortable there's maybe there's lack of confidence uh maybe you don't i, I don't mean that in a, in a in like a degrading way it's just like a lack of confidence and here, here's what i get often i would come on but i don't feel like i have anything to offer and that's what i mean you know people often will say that sort of thing and it's like man you you're a human being you have stories and you have tons to offer. 
And um, so I, I, the only reason why I brought this up is because like, I want to be able to ask you questions about your own personal experience with, with um, what you're, what it is that you're seeing. And because I think that it should be a two way thing. If you want to get the real uh, experience of what's happening in in the corner, yeah, I agree with you. I, I I agree with you. But I will say, before this, I literally sat in front of not in front of my computer and practiced on my dog. Oh, the way that I was going to get out of personal questions <laughs> if you asked them to me. Uh, so um, that happens a lot. I've talked to at least five people who have who would be. They said. Before I was having conversations with people, I would tr be driving down the corner, uh, down the road, and I'd be recording myself talking. So you know, or people would talk in the mirror and stuff. So this is you're in good company. I think there's an inherent hypocrisy. I think to my my, my current position. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, no, I hear what you're saying, Chad. Yeah, lots of people. So, and by the way, and I'm I'm still in Chad's thunder. Like, if you don't want this to be posted, this doesn't have to be posted either. Like, if it's something you wouldn't want to do, that's true. But, but I, I said would, you wouldn't want me to say that. <laughs> no, it's true. I, I think I told you that from the beginning. That I think it was implied from the beginning. Um, no, I think I'm I dig so much into people's lives, you know. I think I think I really want to be in a place and 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 really willing to put myself in a place where um I think the way you said it, it's a it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. So I invite you, Chad. I don't wanna I don't wanna give off um Oh, so like okay, the questions I just have because I'm curious. <clears throat> I'll I'll tell you like this. So I've I've noticed for the last maybe maybe four years or something like this maybe five years, I I got the sense that it seemed like the the culture at large had been um, becoming more and more susceptible to enchantment, which I think is a good thing. And so I started noticing people are becoming more interested in spiritual matters, whether it would be whatever. I don't care what side of the whatever, but they seem to have spiritual questions. Sure. And and I often wondered, well, is it is it actually that, that that's what's happening? Or is it just because I'm in recovery and constantly talking about God and all this stuff that that I'm having this blue car effect where I, you know, you constantly see blue cars when you have a blue car. So so the question is, is something like, I, I, I want to know wh what you're experiencing upon, a, a, as somebody who's, who's newly tripped over this space. I want to know what that's like, because I don't know what it's like to trip over this space. Because by the time I got here, <clears throat> like, there wasn't all there was is PVK, so I don't know what it's like to trip over this space exactly. I can tell you what I uh, after you answer, I'll tell you what my experience is like now. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I imagine my experience with tripping over, uh, I didn't get to trip over this little corner of the internet, you know what I'm saying? I got I tripped over Paul Vander Clay and Jordan Peterson and you know Joe Rogan, and that's. You know. And what he means by that is like in the early days, people were coming around because they kind of came through Paul. And so there weren't all these other people with all these YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. So everyone kind of would like watch Paul's video of the day or they might watch Pejo or a Peterson video. Or, so there was this there was this smaller amount of content. And then so people, everyone would kind of was kind of was this deal like is there were probably maybe only two videos out that were kind of part of the quarter. And that day so it'd be a lot easier to like just watch a couple of those videos. And then what was really cool is because everyone, it's it's kind of like when, uh, well, I'm old enough to remember when there were only four channels pre-cable. Like everyone watched the same thing. So when you went to school, like when Michael Jackson did the moonwalk for the first time live on the Motown Live or whatever, we were all at school talking about, did you see that? Yeah, I saw that, it was amazing. Like everyone watched Michael Jackson moonwalk live on TV. So there was this, since when you first came, it was a lot smaller. And then there were, there were people doing something. 
And now you have all, which by the way, it's great. Now you have all these people and all these different channels and the stuff is just kind of exploded out. So to try and come in and get your head around Grimm and then what's this, what's this who's this guy in this Leduchador <laughs> mask? Like, this is crazy. What's going on with that? And then we got Paul and we got all these other sort of people. Now these people are doing these just chattings. Like, what is this? And so kind of put a fine point on that. It is a, it is a lot to take in right now. Well, the closest I have to tripping over the corner is right after that whole thing where Paul Vanderclay was doing his um, commentary on the Jordan Peterson, John the Peugeot conversation. Um, uh, this channel called Rangos United, um, they also did a conversation. And I, but like, so they had a whole bunch of videos, but I never heard of any. I never knew what that was. And, and I'm watching these guys. I'm thinking like, who do these guys think they are? Like, like who? And also, who the hell are they? And, then and I the Randos United were Bridges of Meaning Discord members. Yes. Who would have conversations, and then it would be posted on because Paul called it Randos conversations, right? So the Randos United became where these individuals started doing these conversations and recording them, and then uploading it to the Randos United. Yeah, and those. Were, they are still very good. There's, I don't know, I think there's almost 700 videos over there. And they are fantastic. And I was, I was very inspired by that concept of posting, um, of anybody can post, you know, videos on that channel. I was inspired by that to do that here too. So, and that's the other thing we're always, we're always kind of like, you know, it's like uh, trading ideas and, and, um, like all, all of my production on this channel now, almost all of it is inspired um, by the Grim Grizz is virtually not alone. I mean, things like this, you know. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> well, we don't do that. Um, th things like that, that's something that, you know, just, <coughs> excuse me, I have, all this stuff is inspired. We've all inspired each other in some way or influenced each other to pick up these little tools and use this stuff. So it's very cool. It's, it's, I, 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 I like to call it like, this is play we're playing, but it's a serious deal too. So, okay. Now the question is as somebody who has newly found this, like what, what is your experience? Like, what are you seeing? Wow. Yeah. So I have to, I have to, I have to confess here. Um, Howard O'Neill told me about all this stuff like over two years ago. And he's like, yeah, you're kind of doing what they're doing. And I said, it's, it, that's a lot. Like there's so much. I started looking up Jonathan Peugeot and, and, and Jordan Peterson and all these people. And, and I'm like, it's just, I, I didn't quite understand the significance of, of what was happening. And I didn't understand like sort of the meaning that if you sit and, and sort of listen to some of the content, you're like, wow, these people are really kind of cultivating this, uh, you know, this really rich, really rich. And then you, I guess you got Tigrog on there and you're kind of like, he's the scapegoat. Okay. Sorry, man. We've all been there. And, and then you got people saying, we've all been there. We've all been there. Um, so um, I don't know. I don't know. Cause like, like the last time I was kind of tuned into this world was probably, you know, mid 2010s, right. When you had Chris Hitchens and um, you had the new atheist, Sam Harris, you had Richard Dawkins, some of these people kind and Daniel Dennett kind of like jerks, but now you've got all of this pushback. And we, I mean, that's how I see it. You kind of, you get all of these people really sort of coming into this, rich and meaningful conversation after not maybe not being satisfied by that and then maybe a whole lot going on that i just haven't figured out yet and don't know what's happening um so i feel like i'm missing a lot uh, that's pretty good i i think actually I, I think it's a lot more simple than like it, it's this is what's interesting about it for me okay. this is why yesterday i was thinking about um so, so I woke up yesterday. I was just in like just a funk. I was not in a good mood. 
I was feeling disconnected. Uh, part of it has to do with um, I for the last probably month and a half, I it was the weather was really cold, and I can make up excuses, but I stepped away from my daily practice of walking the dogs and and during my dog during my dog walk i was doing um some different prayers and stuff like that that were really helpful and and it's just so weird how something so simple can just get me connected well i wasn't doing it and slow and and so i'm coasting the problem with coasting is you're always going downhill when you coast so i'm coasting along and and i just you know i'm 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 naturally a discontented person. Like I'm just a malcontent. And so what ends up happening is I'm just feeling a little disconnected. And yesterday morning was kind of like I was just woke up and I'm just like, God damn it, dude. I'm, I, I got a momentary lapse of nihilism, you know? And <laughs> and it comes and goes. That's where now here's where faith is. I know that it's just gonna show up and like I know I can get out of it and it's not a big deal. But it doesn't mean I can't stop myself from feeling it. So I wake up, I get up, I call Gavin. We're doing our morning thing. I even tell him by the end of that, I'm like, I just feel like shit, man. I don't know. And um, he doesn't try and fix me or anything like that. He just says, okay, you know. And then I get to work. I'm working. And um, on comes Luke Thompson on the Grail Country stream. And and it's, it's pretty cool. And then, you know, that's always a really nice thing to listen to. I, I love Luke. And I often talk to Luke in per, in my private time and stuff like that, too. And then, you know, Gavin starts telling his story on there. I'm like, oh, this is really cool and stuff. And then and then Grim Grizz show comes on. And, and I, all the while I'm tiling this bathroom. And Grim Grizz show comes on. And it's a hilarious show. And I get to look, uh, engage a little bit in the hive mind, which is the comment section. In case you, people don't know that, that's the live chat comment sec, uh, comment section. It's the hive mind, and it's a great show. And then I'm like, oh shit, Neil's got a conversation that's got released with Alan. So I on, on the channel, I'm gonna go listen to that because I haven't listened to it. And I'm listening to it. And I'm like, this is such a really good conversation, man. It's like really good. And then, like, right after that, shit, Christian Baxter, this new this new baller, comes up and he put, releases a conversation with Mike Pilato, who I have a, who I have scheduled in the next month to have a conversation with. So I'm like, I'm gonna listen and have these guys talk. And holy shit, Mike Pilato is outstanding. Like I'm like, wow. And while all this is happening. I just think, how did this happen? Like, how do people, how how did we get to be, how did we get to have this? Like, we don't understand, and maybe I'm being dramatic, but I don't think we understand how, the, the potential that's, that's sitting here. I don't think we do. You know, I, I've spent uh, the last 10 years I'm coming up on 10 years of sobriety. I've spent a good portion of that studying the history of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I love Alcoholics Anonymous. And I've often wondered what it would have been like to be those to be those guys who who helped found, be the founders of AA. And I think and I've I've thought that for <coughs> for a very long time. And fascinated about how how cool would it have been to be these two drunks to accidentally stumble over this thing and then watch something grow before your very eyes. And then, and then I'm sitting here and I'm listening to my friends. I had every one of these guys' phone numbers. <laughs> and I'm listening to these guys and they are just like enjoying their time, having meaningful conversations. And I think maybe it felt like this. Maybe maybe Bill and Bob and those early AA old timers or those early guys, maybe it felt like this. And so I don't think we understand the potential. Now again, I could be 
I could be speaking out of my ass and just being really dramatic. But I don't think that that's the case because if this was just some fly-by-night bullshit, <clears throat> it, it would have died a long time ago. Well, and I think it's a, I think it's a Jordan, uh, uh, Jonathan Pajot, Jordan Peterson talk about this stuff all the time. It's like what you attend to, like what do you, what you focus on, like is going to manifest itself in your life. So if you're out there consuming all this junk that's out there, I don't, you know what I mean? You, you take on this sort of thing and to be able to just participate and hear these conversations, which are so unique, right? And, and then people ask, like, again, they ask really hard questions. People are willing to think out loud, you know, and you're sitting back there and like, oh my gosh, I've always thought about that. And I didn't want the guts to ask it or whatever, or I didn't have anybody to talk about that with or whatever. There's this, it's, 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 it's to me, it's almost like a Chad talked about. It's like, it's counter programming. And kind of that's how it's worked for me a little bit in that I'm not getting sucked up into this other thing. And when I have time and it's, you know, there's been peaks, like I've had time where I've had more time to focus and other times I'm super busy where I just can't keep up at all. Like I went through for a few months where I just couldn't really, I watched very little or whatever. and was kind of a little bit involved with it. But when I actually am participating more and listening more and being a part of this community, like, my spiritual life is better. Like spiritually, I'm I'm a I'm a better person. It reminds me of of these things that can get me into action in terms of practices and so on and so forth. And Bernardo Castro had this amazing book called the uh, Is it the Mass Formation Psychosis or whatever? Anyway, anyway, who's talking about like what's going on right now is that what we need to do is we just need to speak, and really what we're putting out are beacons of light, and people will find their way here. And I think people come here for a lot of different reasons. But if you really want to kind of come down when you think about, let's just take the Christian angle to it. Jonathan Pajot is clearly talking about Christian things in terms of a symbolic way and so on and so forth. Jordan Peterson really started to kick off. He had his biblical series and he's contemplating all the hairy, big hairy questions about God and so on and so forth, right? Um, he tackled Genesis and then he had his Exodus thing. Like that's what he's about. Obviously, we're here because there's a pastor in Sacramento named Paul Vanderclay, who's clearly a Christian man, right? So even atheists or people who had deconstructed or people who had left the church and been hurt by the church or whatever, all sorts of, or people come in and, you know, maybe they're struggling in some aspect or, you know, or maybe they are Christian, whatever it is. Um, there absolutely is a, a, a Christian element to this. Our, bit, our, our desire is, is that like if T. Grog, went, like, I don't know if he, when he first showed up, like everyone, because he was in the comments, you know, making a lot of comments. And then he finally showed up on the screen and literally people were cheering. And Grim highlighted this, like when he finally came up and showed up on the screen, because we, Paul jokes is that we're running out of atheists. And there's two reasons why we're running out of atheists. is We're running out of atheists because a lot of the atheists come in atheists and all of a sudden they find themselves going to church. So there's that problem because atheists are becoming Christians as they come in this little corner. Um, and then the other thing is, is like certain folks, if because we don't, we don't play. If, if if you're if it's just you won't come in and 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 be able to have some sort of open-minded communication. Eventually, this is going to frustrate you if you just keep wanting to do this, 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 and we're kind of like, eh, we I, we get it, but were you open to seeing this? No, nope, this, this, this. You know, at some point that becomes here. Yet you'll see someone like like Grim, and he like he said, I he wouldn't identify like that. I think he's on his new thing, but I think Grim's still on his journey. I think that he says that pretty explicitly, you know, to some of the stuff. I think he's still on his on this journey. Um, and so, um, you know, there definitely is there there absolutely is the Christian out. We you, and, and again, if you're going to come through Paul Pastor. Pastor Vander Clays, if you're watching his YouTube channel, he's talking, you know, he has Sunday morning service, he's living still, he's talking, he was always talking about that, people are asking questions, and he's talking about Christianity in this really interesting cultural monologue way, like it's just, it's incredible how he kind of paints this stuff around that, so there definitely is that draw that I think, even if people don't realize it, there's, there's something about this Christianity that I think people are trying to figure out when they come into. Would you you think that's fair, Chad? Yeah, I think I think yeah, like the 
<laughs> like, yeah, why like why is Tim Grog Grogan T Grog? Why is he sticking around? I mean, you know, like, well, there's clearly something here that he he's getting a, a, the same kind of connection that I think I am. And like, I think, okay, so, so if there's any humility to any of this, it's that we all know that, um, well, most of us anyways, know that we're, like, the final answers on this shit, it, they're just, they're, they're not, it's not about the, it's not about finding, it's not about solving the problem or finding the answer to the problem. It's impossible. Like, it's an ongoing adventure. <coughs> and um, I, there's a clip I want to play. Like, I was just watching this thing today uh, where... So, uh, Peugeot was uh, over on um, t talking to Justin Brierley. Have you guys seen this yet? Uh, I want to play this clip because, like... Well, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should. What do you guys think? Should I play it? <laughs> Your channel, Chad. I want to play this clip because, like, it, this this is kind of like the the adventure of it here. Like, I don't know if this is going to illustrate this, but we'll see. I think what's really interesting to sort of pull out is the so in a in a previous series in a previous episode we had the comedian Frank Skinner on, and he said this tiny little line where he just said because he's a huge poetry fan. And so he took the line from John's prologue, but he said the poem became flesh and dwelt among us. And what he was trying to get at there was that Christianity is like this cosmic poetry. And so I've thought about that and kind of worked on that and dug away at that since. And this idea of we've got such a narrow understanding, but not always, because like you've pointed out, like sometimes we let it go. But in certain circumstances, we have such a narrow understanding of what truth is and where it can be found. And yet the fact that we correct the fact that 2000 years later we're still coming to terms with this resurrection is that not a place where truth of it can be found or the fact that we want it to be real we crave it you know that's c.s lewis mm. you know I've, if i've got a desire that nothing in this world satisfies it's probably because it was i was designed for another world and and i you know the way in another conversation that louise perry put it to me she said i, I just think my disenchanted brain still can't quite cope with the metaphysics of christianity at this point and i <laughs> I just wonder what what's what practically, apart from just sort of bagging on about the wonderful symbolism, you know, that's there. What can help someone who just is in that disenchanted state, but who's just not satisfied with the materialist worldview, to kind of step into this new story, basically? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's not the same for every person, but I would say that you can come at it from the 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 truth of the experience first of all and it if you can't get to the fact of it the other, one of the other problems that is again people live in a world where fact of something happening is always seen at the level of a a kind of how can i say this like that everything is equal in the way that it happened that you know that the resurrection of christ is is the same level of reality that me putting you know like two spoonfuls of sugar into my coffee. Like those are all, it's all equal, but that's not actually how it works. And when people try to account for the resurrection in materialist terms, they're just not going to be able to. It's just not there. It's not there in the text. The text is actually does very much, makes a great effort to break that and makes it very difficult for you to try to account for it in materialist terms in many ways, you know, by the fact that Mary Magdalene doesn't recognize him, by the fact that the disciples don't recognize him, by the fact that there's all these things that are, in, that nobody saw the actual resurrection. Like there's all these things in the text that are trying to tell you the resurrection happened. The tomb was empty. This is a, this is an event that is, that is an event, but is also an event that you will not be able to reduce to chemical material, like nitty gritty historical facts. So if you were looking for that, then you're not going to find it. But the, re the the problem is that you live in that world all the time. It's You don't live in a world where you actually have the nitty gritty historical proof for things. And, and, and the fact that people have this strange desire to find it there particularly when they can see that 
that story is the foundation of Western civilization, is the foundation of our moral system, is the foundation of everything we think to be good today. But I can't go there. But nonetheless, I spend all my days living in a world where I don't need those facts in order to function. I don't need to, to like, I can't prove that my wife loves me. I can't prove that, like, there are all these things that you cannot prove uh, historically. Anyways, all I'm saying is, at some point, you have to face the fact that we live in the Christian world. We live, our world has been transformed by Christ completely, utterly. We live in that world. We live in that story. And we cannot, if we deny the event of the incarnation, then we are undermining everything that we care about. Like you're just undermining everything that, that, that is holding you together. And you cannot have Christianity without Christ. It's just not possible. They tried, the Enlightenment tried, and what you end up with is insane woke or communism or some perversion, like parasitical version of Christianity. But the fullness of, of Christ is bound in, in, that, in him, in, in the fact that he is the anchor of heaven and earth and holds everything together. So, uh, yeah, that clip does kind of get at what I'm what I'm getting at. Like, uh, the, this the, whatever this is, it can't be articulated. And, and Christ seems to be the thing that did bring. Uh, uh, well, it clearly did. Something happened in 2015 and 2016, and uh, something something. Uh, 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 bit Jordan Peterson in the ass to be able to talk about stuff. And then whatever that was, woke up people when he was started talking about it. I mean, I mean, it's, so that's what I think, I don't know. That's why I think brings it, brings us together. Um, and because like Chris said, whatever it was that we were living in before, it doesn't seem to, it, it just, I don't know. It just seems to be a lot of BS. Uh, I don't well, you know. know what I'm happy about tonight, Chad. I need to get going here pretty quick. Just yeah, I mean, I'm kind of burning out myself. But, but God, I think, Clara, God bless you. You got a baptism in this little corner of the internet. First off, she had no idea she'd be sitting here for two hours. And then we're asking you know, questions. Videos. I had a hunch. No, I, 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 sorry, I had to text Howard O'Neill and make sure he actually talked to Chad. I'm just covering my bases here. <laughs> no, I don't Chad, know. Chad, cool. Sorry, what were you saying? No, and then Chad sneak attacks you with me and Grim being on here too. I'm like, what the hell happened, man? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I really appreciate how, how open and, and welcoming you all have really been and, and, and talking to me and, and, and getting to really really sharing with me so i i can't tell you how much i appreciate it and how excited i am uh to, to keep going yeah 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 we we should definitely do this again uh, i'd be very happy to to have more conversations with you as many as you'd like and um if if there's other people that you'd like to talk with let me know and uh if anybody out there would like to talk to clara um you can either email me and I can connect you with her or uh, I know she has an email, but probably doesn't want to give that out quite, quite yet. Maybe check in a week or so, and then I'll put the email. Make sure, we'll make sure that people get a chance to hear it. Cause you're going to get lots of different people are going to have all sorts of wild, different stories um, from all across the spectrum. There'll probably be some threads you're going to pull on, but uh, we're just, but three humble, participants in this 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 little corner of the end i want to hear everybody y'all are amazing well and also i do want to have you on for your own personal rando story i think that would be great <laughs> yeah. um, let's let's warm up to that let's warm up to it i, I guess yeah i can say okay okay all right well is there anything else you'd like to ask let's you know over time that it will unfurl it will be great. I'd love to keep it going. Keep asking questions. You know, I, I wrote down a lot of things while y'all were talking that really interests me, but in time, in time, Chad, in time. Cool. All right, everybody say bye-bye. God bless. Good luck, Clara. Thanks. Thank you, Clara. <laughs>
happy. I want to be sad. I don't want to be happy. I want to be happy. I want to be glad. I want to be happy and glad and never again be sad. I never will cry. I never will sigh because I want to be glad. He never will cry. He never will sigh because he wants to be glad.